Welcome. I am really excited about today's conversation. We are talking with a person who is one of the top living writers and explorers and teachers of Taoist philosophy. His books have been transformational in my journey of self-discovery, understanding myself and nature. Deng Ming Dao, what a privilege and pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. The pleasure and the honor is all mine. Well, I'm yeah, just buzzing about where, where we're going to go today in our exploration. And we're going to explore nature's power, this word de. But for those who are perhaps new to Taoist philosophy in general, and perhaps yourself as well, it might be nice just to give people a bit of your story of, of how you found Taoism. And in particular, what has stood out for you about Taoism that has meant that it's still energizing you so that you are teaching and writing even today? I got interested in Eastern philosophy as a teenager and I was crawling around my mother's bookshelf and I came across some books about Zen Buddhism and a translation of the Tao Te Ching. And so I took note of this word Tao and didn't think much of it. But then as I read other books about painting, about morality, uh, this word Tao kept cropping up. So I thought, well, you know, this seems to be the source of everything. And in the commentaries about Zen Buddhism, the scholars said that Buddhism was highly influenced by Taoism, and that's how Chan or Zen Buddhism came about. To make it more ludicrous, Tao is my given name, and I never really quite put the two together. It's just like, oh, that's what they call me. And then here's this other word. So you mentioned in our preamble, whether there's such a thing as destiny. And so in a way you might see it that way. One of the things that intrigued me was that there was an assertion that Taoism could be found by physical means first. And that seemed to be a great relief to me because trying meditation on my own without a teacher wasn't really working or in retrospect, it probably was working except I couldn't tell the difference. So I had an eye out for that. And as a consequence, I started taking Tai Chi lessons because of this idea that the physical could lead to the spiritual. And eventually I met my Taoist master, Guan Sai Hong, and I met him in the early 80s. And that was exactly the path that he advocated from a step-by-step -step approach, what you do in your warm-ups proceeds all the way in an unbroken path to meditation and that if you wanted spiritual realization meditation was the key to that that's the simple path i still follow today and after more than four decades of exploration and going to see every spiritual teacher who comes to the bay area i still find this to be the best path for me very simply Taoism can answer every question that I have. And I'm, at least personally, can't say that about any other philosophy or any other religion. It works for me. And especially because I revere nature. And Taoism speaks of the primacy of nature. And in fact, that all we need to do is pattern ourselves after nature. That's a great relief to me because anything that's patterned after human defined laws seems to be fallible. Anything that's advocated by argument and logical conjecture can be undone. Nature cannot be undone. We are minuscule compared to nature. We are limited in our lifespans, but nature is eternal. So why not go to that source of truth instead of a man-made one. So that's what keeps me going. And believe me, I am tested every day. I test my path every day. And when I teach, I'm asked questions all the time, some of which I've never heard before. And I can always find the answer in what I've learned. I've never been left saying, oh, I don't know. Mm. So that's good. I think, and that's what keeps me going. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. 
what particularly resonated with me with Taoism is that it looks holistically at your flourishing mind, body and spirit and also your relationship to your environment. And yeah, for me, I was quite indicative of the West of seeing the body is simply a vehicle to move the brain between meetings, as Ken Robinson likes to say, and to come into the body and realize that it is this kind of safe space where I can just relax these the turbulence of my mind. And yeah, all these insights from thousands of years ago that are, the fact that they can still help us despite the world being so different today means that, yeah, they have kind of spoken to some deep understanding of what our nature is as human beings uh, and yeah it's very powerful despite the world being so different today these ancient uh, insights can help us and yes what is your in, i'm sorry go please, on please please oh what, what what i was going to say is when the ancients such as Lao Tzu, left us this these texts it's for no personal profit of their own they're dead mm. They get nothing out of it. What they did was they left us signposts in a very unselfish way. And they're hoping that we can find our way more readily. That's what people like you and I should be doing, making life easier for other people. And in that way, we carry on the tradition. Yes. Yes. And the simplicity of these teachings, they're not trying to self-aggrandize. It's just simple observations of nature and given that these cycles continue thousands of years later those observations are still valid and that learning doesn't have to come from the outside in right this is the authority of the book but instead we can actually find this through our own experience and yeah Lao Tzu and these great texts can point us towards these things something I love about your work is just the simplicity of it and yeah the basing it in real accessible everyday behaviors. Uh, and so, for example, one, one of the great books that I'd recommend to the audience is 365 Tao, which is a daily meditation book of some insights from, from observing nature, both within the nature within and nature without. And yeah, those observations are powerful of that mode of learning that can come from our own experience rather than just the authority of a text. Well, the Tao Te Ching speaks of simplicity. And it speaks of being like a valley. And a valley doesn't have to do anything to fulfill its purpose or its role in life. And yet, everything has to come to the valley. The water runs off the hills. The animals come to the valley. And as a consequence, the valley is one of the most fertile places there are. It does nothing and yet everything comes to it. What that means by comparison is that there is an inner truth to each of us, that we don't need to be anything else but open in ourselves, and all things come to us. Our folly is that we think we need to do something, that we need to become something. But to pick up on what you just said, Maybe who we are is all we need to be. And maybe the only wisdom that we need in confirmation of what we read is also within us. Mm. Yes, and in my mental health journey, I would convince myself I was this. If I had a bad week, I would call myself a failure. If I got anxious, I'd beat myself up and tell me there was something wrong oh, yeah. with myself. <laughs> and yeah when I began my journey of Taoism is just actually you know I am this manifestation of this mysterious and powerful intelligence and we all are and are walking talking breathing miracles of nature and to kind of connect with that is just creates that perspective where we can actually and I have found just to relax into being myself warts and all even the parts of myself that I don't like because they come from this idea of the Tao. Maybe you could talk a bit about, it's obviously the big question in Taoism and the first one that people explore, but um, what, what is, when we talk about the Tao of Taoism, what, what are people referring to? If you look up the word in the dictionary, it has like over a dozen meanings. It can mean the way, direction, 
uh, method, principle, and so on. In the simplest idea, it's movement. Everything in the universe moves. Every atom, every subatomic particle, every molecule, up to the greatest star, the greatest galaxy, everything is moving. So Tao is movement. If you look at the word for Tao, it's a picture of a person represented by a head and the V at the top is two tufts of hair. So there's a face there and on the side it represents feet. It's a person moving, walking, and therefore a path forms. So now, if a person is in movement all the time, and that's undeniable, your heart is beating, you're breathing, you get up and walk around, and if everything else in life is moving, should we synchronize our personal movement with the universal movement? And that's the very simple premise of Taoism. Shouldn't your personal life harmonize with the um, movement that surrounds you? And does that movement that surrounds you, does it have coherence? Does it have a trajectory? And then we might want to be tempted to think about a linear kind of movement. But Taoism very much champions the idea of cycles. So these cycles are going on, and there's not just one, but there are innumerable cycles overlapping, but they are cyclical. So how do you synchronize with that? Well, you mentioned uh, when life is down, or you feel bad about yourself, and believe me, I'm no stranger to that attitude myself. But I'm always at great strain to try to prevent that attitude in my students because it does nothing good. Bad and good come together. That's what the Tao Te Ching tells us. So when things are bad for us, that's part of the cycle too. You cannot refuse it, just like you wouldn't refuse the good part. The idea, which is better articulated in the I Ching, is that when things reach their extreme, they have to turn toward their opposite. So when it's bad, it has it, the only place it can go is get better, yes? But then when everything is good, it calls upon us to be prudent and to try to save our work. So, for example, in the seasons, we have summer, we have a harvest, you know winter is going to come. So the motto for that is that the farmer saves the food, maybe preserves or dried or, you know, nowadays we can have frozen food and so on. We store so we can make it through winter. Bad will come. But do you prepare when things are good so you can make it through the bad times? And when things are bad, do you have enough faith that it will get better? Dawn always comes. So, even in that, well, for most of us, we go to sleep at night and so on. We are synchronized with the cycles of day and night. Can we apply that down to the most minute level? And that's what Taoism is about. Mm. Yes, working with those patterns. And I love that definition of the Tao, movement. And yeah, trying to work with the grain. You know, like if I rip a piece of paper one way, it causes chaos and uh, it's all over the place. If I do it the other direction, working with the grain, then yeah, there's simplicity and order uh, that can work. So same action and yet different result. Um, yeah, so working with those patterns is, is the journey that I, I, we're all on of self-discovery, is raising our consciousness and trying to understand who we are. And when we work with the world, rather than trying to force it into our, our goals and our purposes, then life becomes easier. And yeah, loads of amazing metaphors from nature there. And 
house plants I often turn to because anyone who keeps plants they'll know that some like being by the window some like having a bit more water they have their unique needs and of course we are all unique human beings with our own destinies and journeys and gifts that come easier to us and so to understand what that is and to work with the patterns of, of who we are and yeah if we do that give ourselves what we need then we flourish right but in your example don't you see how we as the caretakers of those house plants have to respect their nature so if you have a plant that needs more sunlight you have to give it to it otherwise it's going to die you can't demand why don't you just get along with the amount of light i give you because i'm the boss you have to respect and accept that and then once you start to grow the plant, you give it the right amount of light, you give it the right amount of water, maybe some fertilizer every now and then, and then you have to leave it alone. So you probably have heard about that, you know, um, Chinese proverb about the farmer who pulled on the plants. And so we don't want to do that. We want to uh, have the privilege of taking care of a living thing. And that just means nurturing it and then letting it be. Could we do that to ourselves? Could we respect ourselves as much as we respect our houseplants? And oftentimes we don't. We say, why aren't you getting by with five hours sleep? Why aren't you going to work at 6.30 in the morning? Why aren't you working harder? Why aren't you smarter? Why aren't you this, 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 this? we beat ourselves up with a greater vehemence than anybody else and that distorts us so it's not a matter of practicing to quote get better it's a matter of practicing just to remove all these unnatural habits that we've either been taught or that we develop ourselves and then we can have a beautiful flourishing life Beautiful. And yeah, something that I think that links very well to is the kind of the main exploration that we'll do today is around De. So the Tao De Jing is the foundational text of Taoism. And often people think that this word De is like a connecting word, but it is an important concept in itself. Could you talk a bit about your understanding of what this De is in the Tao Te Ching? So it's usually transferred, I'm sorry, translated as the word virtue. But if you look at the word virtue, it combines again the idea of feet or movement, a cross, an eye, and the heart. What can the eye see accurately? And can that be put in the heart? And then can you behave accordingly? Now, there are two applications of that idea in the Tao Te Ching. And one of the difficult things about the Tao Te Ching is that it consciously and delightfully uses words that have multiple meanings. And in the same chapter, it will jumble all those meanings together. You're supposed to know when the word means one thing by the context and another thing by a different context. And it likes that kind of wordplay. So at the very least, it does refer to the virtue in the sense of one's moral quality. But it also is parallel to the way we use the word virtue in English, by virtue of. And we say by virtue of refers to some if you will, power or ability or property of the entity that we're thinking about. So now, how does the idea of our moral quality fit with the idea of the ability or the power of something to affect something else? And what I would point out to you is that it's synonymous 
that our character, our virtuous character, has to be synonymous with who we are. So that there is no difference between how we behave, what we're able to do as our virtue, and the quality of how we behave, our ethical and moral value. When the Tao Te Ching, in my opinion, speaks of the way and virtue, it's not saying that our physical surroundings are generated by virtue, but rather that our physical surroundings themselves have virtuous qualities. They are natural. We hear about virtue and we think of a sermon. We think of our school teachers, we think of our parents, we think of the primers that tell us what to do. We think virtue is a persuasion. And people are unique among all living creatures in that they can choose not to be virtuous. We're the only living creatures that can choose not to be our natural selves. And so, um, as a consequence, we make this error, and we think everything else has that choice. But that's erroneous. Nothing else in nature chooses to be unvirtuous. It, they don't think. See, we think. Nature doesn't think about what it ought to do. It just does. And when it does, everything is spontaneously and correctly virtuous. So we ought not to make the mistake that because virtue is a choice to us, that we think everything else chooses to be virtuous. No, everything else is naturally virtuous with no separation between action and virtue. It's only we who are in our folly choose not to be virtuous. Yes, and a chapter from the Tao Te Ching where Lao Tzu talks about superior virtue, or like true virtue is not aware of itself being virtuous, or yeah, true de is not aware of itself being de, and this spontaneous aspect to nature where yeah, nothing is done and yet yeah, nothing is left undone. And maybe now is a good chance to explore chapter fifty-one, which is a interesting kind of. Yeah, it's quite a detailed explanation from Lao Tzu of kind of the relationship between Tao and De and all the myriad things. And I believe we have the privilege of you exploring your own interpretation of chapter 51. Right. So, you know, he opens up and the way I translate is that Tao gives life and virtue fosters it. Now, that would make it seem as if it's a two-step process. But I think we need to see that as aspects of the same thing. That Tao does give life, and it's the virtue of Tao that fosters it. It's not handing off to somebody else, right? Um, what that means is that everything comes from Tao, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then for it to grow, it's being it's growing by being fostered through the virtue of Tao. Now, I referred earlier to the movement of the universe. We cannot deny that everything comes to us from outside. You have to breathe, you have to eat, you have to drink water. You have to stand on the ground. Without gravity, you just float off. Everything comes to us through this movement. That's what giving life is. And life creates new life. There's one unbroken stream of life in this world. And that stream is traceable in theory, back to the very first moment. 
That's what evolution is about. All of us have parents. None of us came into this world without a mother and father. Life makes new life. And if we have children, we become their parents and life makes more life. But once you have that life, why does it grow? Why is it supported? And do you see, once life takes place, the virtue of this world continues to support that life with food and air and water and sunlight and wind. So that again gets at this idea that it's the virtue, the power of Tao, but that that power is inherently good and virtuous, right? Um, nobody is ever denied air by nature. It's just all around you. And nobody would be denied anything else, food and water and so on, except for the fact that we have messed everything up with pollution. But that's not what nature did. We poisoned ourselves. And we have created an economic system that consciously tries to withhold access. Oh, you want gold? I'll sell it to you. You want a peach? I'll sell it to you. You want an iPhone? I'll sell it to you. You don't have the money? Well, too bad. But you see, and so far, if they could, I'm sure someone would try to sell air to you, but it's just, you know, too outrageous and too difficult. They already try to sell water to you, right? The bottle of water that's everywhere and so on. It's okay when the exchange is fair, but we live in a world where that has gotten way out of whack and is unfair. So aside from the way we've messed everything up, nature will deny nobody. Virtue fosters. And you could, if you lived in a world that was completely natural, you could go your entire life and be provided for. And you don't have to qualify. You don't have to do anything special. Nothing. It's just all there. And by the way, look how marvelous it is. Nature takes all of our waste. The waste gases, you know, everything else that you eliminate and it turns it back into new life. And at one time in the old days, there were night soil collectors. And that's an example of how our waste, which we don't want, which we find odious, which we even find sickening and disgusting, nature takes it and it makes new life. Nobody can do that. So this is what it means. The Tao gives us everything, but then is it incoherent? Does it stop after that? No. The virtue of Tao consistently and endlessly fosters us. Yes, and I find that a very inspiring and especially for the challenges of our times where yeah we we need to get past these false dichotomies of the enemies being over there and we're being the goodies then they've lost it and we're the sensible ones because yeah the sun shines on everyone every morning the rain pours on anyone whether they're virtuous or not and so this deep generosity in nature and that sense of there being enough because if we feel like there's enough unlike the the economic systems that we all inhabit based on scarcity uh, their very kind of raison d'etre is to to kind of yeah create competition between people for resources um but yeah that that is a mindset which is perpetuated by systems when actually nature there is enough and, and do you see because you asked about the word virtue do you see how these systems have co-opted the word virtue? So that they want to define virtue in favor of themselves. 
And then you talked about the idea of scarcity. Do you see how organized religion emulates that same model? You are cursed unless you come to my institution. You are lost unless you come to me. And only I can give you access to the divine. So if you want to come, you need to join. You need to tithe. You need to offer your devotion. You need to give me your children to raise in my organization. And then we have followed that same model. They have tried to substitute a human definition for virtue instead of a universal and natural one. Yes. And the challenges of our times is that, yeah, we've got this immense power from our technology and from science and yet we still have these worldviews where we break everyone apart into enemies over there and goodies over here and then that was in previous centuries supported by religion but we're kind of in this limbo period where there is still this kind of feeling of separation even though we are you know generally atheist and well obviously there's a huge diversity on the different countries but yeah, there needs to be a story that unites us, uh, an understanding that yeah, we all come from the Tao and that although we may speak, think and look differently, that, yeah, we are not that different. Well, that's a message that you and I have to spend our whole lives repeating. <laughs> and But we're up against some very um, difficult, powerful and shadowy forces. There are many hidden people who benefit by the divisiveness in the society. And if you have any bit of education, the theories and the logic that they're putting out becomes more and more absurd and very difficult to justify if you have any kind of critical thinking at all. But they get away with it. And then they exploit that divisiveness someone is profiting from the divisiveness. This is our great folly as people, is we think the words have the force of real meaning. But words are also used to lie. So not just the divisiveness of society, but the deception that's rife in society is a great tragedy. So maybe that's why the Tao Te Ching opens up with a warning about words, mm. right? They are not the constant Tao. And there are all sorts of people who are throwing words out there with greater um, rapidity now with the internet. And they are deceptions. And people by the millions fall for them. There must be a special place in hell reserved for that kind of person who willfully tricks so many people. But we're here on earth. And so it's up to us to separate and discern what the words really mean. Mm. Yes, an inspiring message. And, and again, that's one of the, the things that really resonates and I celebrate about Taoism is the very opening lines are, you know, the Tao that can be talked about or contained in words is not the actual Tao. If someone gives you an X, Y, Z, this is how the world works and this is the team you should be on, uh, they have yeah, missed the full complexity and wonder of, of how things really work. The next um, couple of lines in chapter 51 I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on uh, because, yeah, that's beginning to talk about these sort of circumstances and the unfolding of the Tao and yeah, perhaps how we can navigate that as individuals. So it, at least in my interpretation, things take form and power completes them. That's why 10,000 things revere Tao and value virtue. So things take form. And you know the idea that matter is energy and energy is form, right? So energy manifests itself and it takes on a certain form. But then 
when just as a kind of metaphor you have a body but why does that body move and in in case of a human being why are you born with instincts why are you born wanting to eat and be warm and so on you come with those qualities and so it's the power this kind of universal power of life that helps you survive in this world 10,000 things is a reference to all living creatures and all matter as well that means everything if you will everything in every body okay so that's why everything reveres Tao because it realizes that the movement of the world is what you know was our origin and so on and they value virtue that virtue that makes us alive that's also natural right it's only we again who can choose to be irreverent when Tao is revered and virtue is valued then everyone heeds with constant nature so if you choose to revere Tao and value virtue and if you can find those um, ideas within yourself and you heed it you'll find your own constant nature well, what does constant mean that means that which is always there and when we go with man-made ideas it becomes inconstant we're in this on this roller coaster good and bad good and bad good and bad want and don't want mine and not mine but if we can revere Tao we will then value nature and then we will see our own nature too so Tao gives life virtue fosters they forever raise all, shelter from harm, nurture and protect. This is one of my constant messages. This is a good world. Uh, I forget who said, you know, life is nasty, brutish and short. Hobbes. But Hobbes, yes. Um, but it's not. You see, it's a good, wonderful, beautiful world. If you, you talked about going out in nature and that there's a gorge that's 10 minutes away from you. If you go out into the world where there are no people, which is getting very hard these days, it's a marvel of how everything is balanced and working. There's nobody out there. There's no divine gardener ordering things around. It happens by itself. And if you had to survive in the wilderness assuming you had some skill and ability you probably could find a means to get by right so everything in this world is good and virtuous and it raises us meaning it helps us get old right and nurtures us it shelters us from harm you can find a cave right in in a storm and so on and it nurtures and protects us you know it somehow including our own instincts and abilities we manage to get to old age without really just killing ourselves well that's a kind of virtue too yes and that's inborn so now if you consider i think these last lines actually open the way to another kind of view so let me read that first at least in my interpretation life and non-being action and instability endurance and disorder these are called mysterious virtue so now it's giving you a definition of virtue of this mysterious virtue and do you see how it gives us pairs of values and I, I try very hard to say things like opposites because I think that sends the wrong message. These ideas, life and non-being, for example, or action and instability, these come together. 
you cannot have one without the other. You can't just say, I'll take the second half, <laughs> but I, I don't want the first half. No, you, everything comes together. So how is it that life consists of all these pairs, but we, even though we might judge them to be opposites, they emerge as a kind of unity. So in the Tao Te Ching, everything happens through these pairs. Um, one of the opening statements is, the world um, only knows beauty because of ugliness. We only know things because of contrast. If there was no contrast, you and I couldn't even see each other right now. So you need dark and light even to judge the world. And if there wasn't a sequence of silence and sound, I wouldn't be able to talk to you. Everything consists of these pairs, and these pairs must be taken together and cannot be separated. How is it then that the world works through this kind of um, binary movement? That's what mysterious virtue is. And so you talked about the divisiveness of the world. And we as human beings are preoccupied with the seeming ultimate pair, life and death. And it's the combination of those things. Why that continues to work. How Tao takes those pairs and unifies them that becomes the mysterious virtue. The virtue then, again, virtue as the power of, you know, an entity to complete something, as well as the fact that that power is good, that's mysterious. Another term for mysterious is profound. Here we are searching for the truth, theoretically, it's right there. It's in our very being. It's all around us. This profound ability of Tao to bring forth life and to nurture it. Wow. So much, yeah, deep insight there and so much to celebrate. And yeah, I think it's such, such an important feeling that we are supported and actually we do live in an incredibly, unbelievably beautiful world and this abundant creativity. And yeah, the, the idea from Hobbes that life is short, brutish and uh, brutal, whatever the, the third one is. Na is nasty, brutish and short. Nasty, brutish and, sh and short is, it undersells the true magnificence of, of nature. And of course we are one manifestation of that. And yeah, I think that one of the most powerful practices has been centering for me and i think that idea of constancy is, is so important you know like history shows that nothing is inevitable and so like the way that we currently set ourselves up although those in power would like us to believe that this is just the way things are and human nature is selfish and this is the best system for us uh, but history shows that that's not the case uh, and yet we as individuals can connect with our center and, and yeah returning to the body and this is how we started our conversation of you on you coming to Taoism through these body practices and that being an inst instructive teacher because yeah wherever you go taking a breath coming back to the present moment can be that safe space to return to which is a super powerful practice you see buried in what you just said is the primacy of the individual. That you can be a free thinking individual and you are valid in your mind and body. That's a very radical proposition nowadays. Everyone wants to control you or they want to at least hook you up as a consumer and just bleed you. And the teachers and the ministers and the philosophers want to tell you what to think. And everyone wants adherence. But what you're talking about is 
being a person in nature, in touch with one's own nature, and trusting one's own thoughts and abilities to guide oneself. That is the radical proposition of Taoism, and that is the only true one, as far as I'm concerned, the best way to live. Mm. I think trust is such an important word. And one thing I'd love for you to clarify, and I'm sure, yeah, I know that some of the audience have this question as well, is the relationship between Wu Wei and De, this virtue that we've been talking about. Because I think one aspect of Wu Wei or our ability to relax into just spontaneously living lightly is to trust ourselves and trust the Tao and, and trust our ability to respond to what comes up. So yeah, could you talk a bit about the difference or the similarities you see between Wu Wei and, and De? So if you go back to the early part of our conversation, Tao does everything correctly. Even when it seems not in our favor, it's correct. A storm wrecks everything, but that turns out to have some purpose later, or role later, or result. And so if we assume that Tao is also virtuous in its movement, then can we accept that as not a model that we take on for ourselves, but our true nature. Our true nature is to behave in a way that is right and will be kind and compassionate by virtue of itself. So, Wu Wei means that can you act in a way that is not for the sake of some result, but is your natural way of acting. Now, there are some misconceptions that we need to address. Wu Wei is usually translated as non-action. And so the shallow interpretation of a lot of people is, oh, I don't have to do anything and Tao will bring me everything. Well, you know, how's that working for you? Just try to drive across town and not make any conscious attempt and assume that Tao will bring everything to you. That's not going to happen. And they think that, oh, whatever comes into my mind is Wu Wei. But they haven't taken the time to really make sure that their mind is working from its natural standpoint. So it doesn't mean not to do anything. It means that what you do has to come out of your natural virtue. And then it's going to be correct. Now just think back, like a long way back, to childhood. For most children, they are naturally good and innocent. If a, a classmate falls down and skins their knee, then they get upset and they go to tell the teacher, right? And they'll take care of somebody. It's only as we get older and get distorted by society that that innocence gets trained out of us. Oh, Get the other person before it gets you. Life isn't going to do you any favors. Why are you helping him? He's a competitor. You need to be first in your class. You need to get this job. Nobody else will get it. Right? We're trained to be selfish. And so that natural innocence is suppressed or destroyed. So... Only by returning to that natural innocence can we truly be Wu Wei. Then it doesn't mean you don't act, but it means that the way you act is going to be fitting with the situation and inherently virtuous. 
Now we have a, um, a problem as human beings. We think first and then we act. In fact, I, I know I had teachers who talked about that all the time, and maybe you did too. Think before you act. Think first. Didn't you think about it? But you see, immediately there's a division between our intention and our action. Can you attain a state of Wu Wei in which there is no separation between thought and action? Now, as an example, what happens when a cup falls off the table and you try to grab it by reflex? There is no thought and then action. Or what happens if you play music or you dance? If you try to count the beats, or you say, yeah, I'm going to do this pirouette now, and you've never done it before. Or, yes, I want to play this chord, and you don't quite know where to put your fingers. That's not non-action. But a great musician, it just, some Chopin piece just flows out of them, and you just, you're left with your mouth hanging open. And they say, I don't quite know how it happened when they come off stage. That's a kind of non-action. You see? So, to attain that state in which there is no division between thought and action is also Wu Wei. So, non-action, in short, is a kind of state of being in which we spontaneously act in accordance to circumstance in a way that is naturally virtuous, uh, and then there is no division between thought and action. That is, to me, uh, a better way to think of Wu Wei. Mm. Amazing. And yeah, lots of practical ideas there. And because that is quite a tangible way of understanding Wu Wei is that can you unify your intention with your action? And yeah, there's conversations, for example, like here now, we're not pre-planning what to say, you know, hopefully just being present. And there's this immense subconscious intelligence that then, you know, you say something and then a thought pops up and then you just simply communicate it. You don't have to, you know, be in a date and be writing down the five-step plan of what you're going to say when, just allow that, right. that intelligence. Right. And, and I think you also struck on something else. What does it mean to be with somebody else? All you have to do is be present. And that is all you need to do. But you know, it's it's like somebody who's about to go on a date and they like try to write out some clever thing to say, and yes, you know, at this point, then maybe I can kiss her and all that. That messes everything up. Just be there and be present. And on the other end of life, um, I know people now who are going through a difficult time because someone in their life is dying. What do I do? What do you do? You just have to be there. You're not going to necessarily change the outcome if the prognosis has been, you know, difficult and the person is in hospice. And you're not going to benefit anybody by lying to them. Oh, you're going to get better. No, you have to accept the situation and be there as difficult as it is. But by being there, you have to trust that your mere presence alone is what is necessary. You're an important person to that dying relative. And all they want is to see you and for you to be there. And do you see how beautiful that is? You don't have to be be somebody else. You don't have to dress a certain way. You don't have to have fancy words. You have to be there. And that's comfort enough for that person. So I think we overlook that too. If I'm here and I'm myself, is that good enough? And not only is it good enough it's the best way to be. And that's what Tao champions. So you are Tao. 
and you have virtue or you are virtuous and that's enough that's all you need to be and that's the message and then we say we're still dissatisfied you know, no one admired me or you know i was just quiet in a corner and no one came up and talked to me and so on but that's okay don't try to pretend to be somebody else and what happens when it's the other way around oh a thousand people wanted my autograph and don't be foolish enough to believe your own press you had a task when the thousand people came up to you and all you need to do is fulfill that with humility and compassion and then the job is done and you go on to something else so whether life is grand or whether it's low we accept it because we don't try to make these distinctions we don't try to puff ourselves up we want to claim that inner innocence and that again is our way and our virtue um yes our presence is a present as a, a nice yes, little rhyme that's and good yeah it's a real gift and and one feels it when the person in front of you is really present and you can see that they haven't glazed behind the eyes and there's the, the spirit looking straight at you and that is a precious thing and and actually very liberating to, to hear that and I think that's such a, a beautiful message for us to to close up our conversation for today is to yeah we are enough and in those situations that can be difficult where we think oh what do I need to say and what do I need to do but just bring yourself and that's very liberating. Thank you so much for today. Wow, what a deep conversation Thanks. and understanding, yeah, the Tao and De, this, this virtue coming from this incredible intelligence that we are all a part of. And yeah, holding on to the center and our nature and realizing that that's enough. Any closing thoughts and any resources that you would, if people would love to learn more with you, any books or courses that you'd recommend for the people to continue their journey? Well, I think they should watch your videos, number one, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, you can look up my website, dengmingdao.com. And, you know, I offer occasional Zoom courses and also free talks on uh, via Zoom. So if you're interested in more, you know, look that up and you can also find a list of my books there. So it's really my privilege and honor to talk to you. And I enjoyed our conversation and I wish you the very best. Thank you. All the best.